of farms from across the region and uh, we can do it from the comfort of our own house this year. So uh, hopefully next year, everybody will be in, at the Big E, just like we normally do with the banquet. So I'd like to welcome everybody. I wanted to take just a minute to talk about what we're gonna do tonight. And we, we have a person working in the background, Elena. She's from the Big E and uh, She's kind of like the, in the Wizard of Oz, the wizard who's behind the curtain, and she's making sure everything works and uh, does a great job. So I am super indebted to her, and uh, Alicia Oded is also in the background working and doing some work. Now she is going to uh, turn off your video camera so we can conserve some bandwidth uh, so we don't get uh, disjointed a little bit. And she's going to mute everybody's microphone so that we reduce any background noise that might occur. And the people that are going to speak and present tonight, uh, they can turn their microphone on when they get called to be a part of the program. So um, we've got a, a nice group of people here. We've got uh, uh, 56 unique emails that have signed on to the recognition event tonight. And as I can see some of the video on the screen and scroll through the people that are signed on, more than one person is sitting at many of those computer screens. So the actual number of people that are in attendance tonight is probably up over 75 or 80. So uh, I, I think that's fantastic. And uh, so I'd like to start by welcoming everybody to our recognition event tonight. This is the 73rd year of the Green Pastures Program, I believe. And many of you know the history of the Green Pastures Program, but it all started in 1947 with the following challenge that was made. And the challenge was, I challenged the other New England states to produce better pastures than New Hampshire and I bet a hat that they can do, can't do it. So that was the beginning of what turned out to be one of the most successful regional programs in New England when Governor Charles Dale, who was then governor of New Hampshire, challenged the other New England states to produce better pastures. And we have a picture in our archives of all the, the six New England governors in their top hats uh, during that challenge. So that's, uh, it's pretty interesting to look at that. So that challenge by the New Hampshire governor to his fellow New England governors started a tradition which has involved hundreds of dedicated farmers, farm families, and agribusiness leaders. And so tonight we're here to honor the winners from 2020 uh, from a tradition that started in 1947. So congratulations to everybody. I wanna remind everybody that the meeting is being recorded and that you wanna, if your microphone isn't turned off, you wanna turn it off unless you're gonna speak because that'll reduce some background noise. And if you don't know how to turn your microphone off, if you look if you move your mouse pointer down towards the bottom of your screen, a menu will pop up. And in the far left-hand bottom corner, there'll be a microphone icon. And if you click on that, then you'll get a slash through your microphone and that means that you're muted. And, and then you can click on that again to unmute it if you're gonna speak, or you can even hit the space bar briefly and that will unmute your microphone as well. So I'd like to take just a second and talk about uh, the Green Pastures uh, officers. My name is Gary Anderson. Uh, I'm coming to you tonight from Bangor, Maine, and we've got uh, a group of people all across New England, and I've been chair of the Outstanding Dairyman's Program since 2001. Uh, John Porter is in New Hampshire, and he uh, serves as secretary. Mike McPhail uh, just moved to Connecticut, and uh, he's treasurer. Donna Willem is chair from the Big E, and uh, Pat Richardson from Vermont is vice chair, and Elena Hov Hovagimian 
is our wizard behind the screen making sure that everything works tonight. So the next part of the program, I'd like to have uh, Mike McPhail, our treasurer, just talk for a few minutes about the donations and to thank the people that, that did donate in support of the Green Pastures program for this year. Thanks, Gary, and uh, congratulations to, uh, to all of the winners. Um, this program is entirely funded through donations. Um, so just wanted to give a shout out to all of our uh, generous donors um, and give them the recognition. If you see them, um, you know, as you go about business or interacting in your community, be sure to give them a thanks for, uh, for donating to this special program. Um, we, uh, we've got a few different levels of sponsorship at the platinum level uh, through the Ag Enhancement Grant is Farm Credit East and Yankee Farm Credit. At the gold level, um, we have Phoenix Feeds and Nutrition, as well as Granite State Dairy Promotion. The silver level, we have Rogers Spring Hill Farm. We have Agrimark. We have IBA. And we have Dairy Farmers of America. At the, bronze at the bronze level, we have Rick Flint. We have Carol Hodgton. We have Aruta's Dairy Farm. We have Mona's Dairy Farm. Be Bud and Betsy Booth. Vermont Farm Bureau. Uh, the Hunt Family and Hunt Farm. Uh, John Porter and Farm Planning Services, LLC, IBA Inc. of Vermont, and Gordy, Gordon and Nancy Gray. Uh, in the other category, uh, we have South Deerfield Vet Clinic, Highland Farms, Fairmount Farms, Exeter Veterinary Services, Elaine Forst, Blue Slope Farm, Harold Souther, Carter and Stevens Farm, Gordon and Patricia Richardson, and Chuck Price. We also have a donation in memory of Dwight Dellert uh, by Nancy Dellert. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. That's great. That's a super support for a, a long-term program. So next, we're going to start our tour of New England, and we're going to start that in Vermont. And so I would like to start our recognition of the Sunderland Farm from Bridport, Vermont. And we'll start by asking Anson Tebbets if he has any comments that he would like to make. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome uh, from the Green Mountains. Uh, we wish we were all together in West Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, chatting next to us at a, at a banquet and maybe touring the grounds of the Big E after that and enjoying a weekend at, at the Big E. But this is wonderful and we congratulate all the, all the farmers across New England including the Sunderland uh, family. Six generations uh, with the working the land and the, ad, and the animals in Addison County, always um, with one foot in the past, but really looking to the future. A wonderful family that's always innovating, thinking about the future, taking care of their land, uh, a special attention to the improving the water quality. Um, you know, farmers are being asked to do so much now, uh, but the Sunderlands and uh, a number of farmers across New England are stepping up, taking care of their land, their animals, and they're feeding us. Never forget that. Um, the farmers across uh, the nation are feeding us, especially during this pandemic. I think there's been a, a special uh, recognition that farmers, hey, you're, you're pretty important. You're doing some great work out there. And I think it's been a refocus. And the Sunderlands are part of that. Uh, they're employees. It's a big family. Uh, they love what they do a lot of positive energy, and we, uh, we cherish these moments to recognize farmers like the Sunderlands for their contributions to the little state of Vermont and across New England. So congratulations to them, congratulations to our neighbors, and thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Anson. Uh, next, we'll go to Tony Kitsos, who's introduce the Sunderland family. Thanks, Gary, and thank you, uh, Anson, for coming on and giving those kind words. Um, I'm going to let that stand and, and be the introduction to the Sunderland family. Uh, I, I, I just want to take a moment and thank Gary for the effort uh, bringing us all together as uh, state coordinators to actually pull this off this year in such a difficult year uh, that it's been to organize, uh, organize anything. Um, but We've got it done, uh, we've got it going on, and um, without further ado, I'm going to just say congratulations to the Sunderland family, and uh, let's see their presentation. 
Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, Margaret or Bob, do you have any comments that you want to say right before we start the presentation? I guess not a lot, but uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty. We're pretty honored to be nominated and then selected for this. Um, yeah, we've just uh, we've just been honored by this whole process and being able to see other farms that are doing the same things that that we are. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just thankful. Okay, great. Well, we'll load up the presentation. Sounds good. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael, and this afternoon for France Dotard. At the start of 2020, all indications were that this would be a good year for Vermont dairy farmers. Milk prices were projected to rise after years of decline. Any optimism for dairy was curdled by the pandemic. Prices dropped, processors asked farmers to cut production, and 25 Vermont dairy farms went out of business between March and July. And yet for all these challenges, Vermont's dairy farmers persevere. And our story today is about the dedication, about dairy farming, and about family. For well over a century, the Sunderland family has been raising animals in Addison County. And that commitment is only one reason why Sunderland Farms is being named the 2020 Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year. We'll meet the family in a moment. But to begin, here's Vermont's Secretary of Agriculture, Food and Markets. A commitment to their community and their cows. Hi, I'm Anson Tebbets with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Congratulations to the Sunderland Farm for being the 2020 Vermont Farm of the Year. They've done it for many generations on their Addison County farm, more than 350 acres. They have focused on quality milk, taking care of their animals with comfort, and also taking care of their land, focusing on the environment. For generations, the Sunderlands have embraced change. They've employed some of the best conservation practices in Addison County, focusing on what's best for the environment and their neighbors. Congratulations, your great neighbors to all of us here in Vermont. Best of luck for the rest of the year in 2020 and years beyond that, as they are the farmers of the year. Well done. I'm Keith Silva, and this is Sunderland Farm in Bridport. The Sunderland family has been raising crops and animals and running one kind of agricultural business or another for over 150 years. This is family land. We've been here forever, and it's just a really good feeling to be home. Yeah, you got 10 or so that need to come up there, don't we? The farm is owned by Harold Sunderland, yeah. his brother Larry, so. and Larry's son, Bob. Get all that done. They manage 450 cows and crop 550 acres. The engine that drives this farm is family. It's a legacy that both bolsters and humbles Bob. Everyone that is here contributes and they, everybody cares. It's, it's like, so we have two people outside of our family, but I would consider them family as well. And that's what makes this whole thing go. It's just family. Everybody, you know, works together. And we try to do as good of a job with every aspect of the farm as we can, from the cows to the calves to the land. Did you learn that from your uncle and your father? It all starts somewhere, right? So I think it all started with them. Just passed down to them, and now it's passed down to me that I just want to continue that legacy and then eventually pass it on to my kids if it's something they want to do. The hills that roll out from where the barns and the buildings stand have been home to farmers for as far back as anyone can recall. Bob's aunt Margaret is the family historian. I just want to tell you one story about um, a piece I found in an old newspaper. I was looking at this 1816 newspaper and it said uh, 92 acres for sale and it start, started describing it and I realized it was this property. It said there was a pleasant house 
with log barns and other log buildings. And I was just like, this is great. I just, it was very exciting to find that. Margaret takes pride that her family have been the stewards of this land as it's been passed down from generation to generation. I don't know there's a whole lot of people that have that kind of roots. I mean, I, I know a lot of farms do. A lot, it's been in the same family for years, but I, I think it's the, you know, knowing that your great grandfather did the same thing you're doing here. <laughs> Maybe with sheep instead of cattle, but you know, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good feeling just to, good. On behalf of Vermont Dairy Farms and dairy farms all across New England, Tony Kitsis chairs the committee that selects the Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year. As soon as he and the judges pulled into the driveway, they knew they were looking at a strong contender for this award and an ambassador for Vermont agriculture. The judges drive up. Their first impression is what they see. Here they saw a beautiful farm. They saw beautiful barns, up-to-date modern technology, modern equipment, and that strong desire to create a business that could be transferred to the next generation. The judges always have that conversation. Who would make a good ambassador for the Vermont dairy industry nationwide and in some cases international? Uh, and, and as we discussed it and as the judges discussed it, this is the farm that rose to the top. The Sunderlands have a reputation for implementing conservation practices like reducing tillage and planting cover crops to protect soil. Larry Sunderland <laughs> says this commitment to conservation is the way it's always been. We just wanted to get the land in good shape for crops and stuff like that so you could grow, grow better crops. And I was that way with my father the same way. He just wanted to get good crops. He never carried corn more than one year on a piece of land. So corn takes a lot of the nutrients out of the soil and especially clay, it's hard to grow corn anyways. And he liked to keep rotating it because he wanted to uh, keep his fields, you know, with good, good grasses and hay on it and stuff like that. For as far back as I can remember, there's always been a principle of, well, how much nutrients do we need to put on the land? We don't need to overdo it. You know, I think it, it only makes the crops better if you can put on what you need and not any extra. There's really no... Point. So that's always been there. Recently, we've been starting to do some no-till practices and minimal till for corn growth, and it works. So it only makes sense to do it. You know, we're just put on this earth to, you know, I think take care of it. You know, like we were given that responsibility. And, um, you know, it's just farming is a big part of that, you know, just taking care of this, this planet. The latest innovation to land on the Sunderland farm is the Lely Astronaut, a robotic milking machine. When the robots were installed a few years ago, Larry wondered what his dad might have made of all this. Boy, something different. <laughs> My father would have fell over backwards, I think. He probably would have thought, what, what is this, you know? <laughs> he never, because he started out years ago, probably milking cows by hand and using the old milking machines that they had back in. Infrared scanners and self-cleaning scrub brushes have taken the place of the farmer. Bob sees this not as a loss, but as a boom to the farm's labor and efficiency. Milking with the robots has been pretty darn good. It, um, you know, from a labor standpoint, we have gotten way more efficient in our labor. You know, it allows us to do crops earlier in the day and stay later if we have to and you know it's it's a lot a lot of flexibility you know and plus there's things with the robots that you can keep track of on the cow that maybe you wouldn't have spotted before but if you have a good eye for cows you can usually see stuff anyway but it definitely helps having the information as well the robots represent the future of Sunderland farm they're also symbolic of a change in the farm's ownership Bob became part owner of the farm a couple of years before the robots were installed and the new barn was built. Helped by UVM Extension's Transferring the Farm program, the Sunderlands have ensured the family's agricultural legacy will continue. Keeps the farm going, which kind of a, what we really wanted to do, I guess, when they built the barn up there. Wanted to keep the place going. It was either uh, do something like that 
or downsize, you know, downsize from what we had here and just maybe cut down maybe a few, some numbers of cows and, and that kind of stuff. But if he had been here, you know, and he didn't show an interest in it, well, probably wouldn't have done it all, you know. We were very glad to have Bob want to be in and because not all, not all farm kids want to. And so we were real glad to have Bob be in as part of the, to be in the farm and to be an, an owner. And that was, that was a good thing. Cause we didn't, he didn't want to be a hired man for all his life. Yeah, especially on his family farm. <laughs> I think if you're gonna make a successful transition, you really gotta have a plan in place to do it. You know, and that's been beneficial for sure. Were there some hard conversations when that process was going through? I don't think they were ever really too hard, you know? I mean, I think I think everybody's interest around here is what's, you know, what is gonna be the best to keep the farm going. I think that that's always been in everybody's mind, and I don't think that's ever gonna change. Farm transition planning is also known as succession. The success of the Sunderland farm comes down to a single word, family. It's good, I mean, I just, I wouldn't go back, you know, and say I didn't like it because I had to like it all these years, you know. <laughs> After 50 years, I think so. <laughs> I'd have to say I'd like it, you know. And it's, it's hard sometimes. And it's, that's why a lot of guys get family involved in it because, you know, just to keep the ball rolling, you know. I was thinking about why I would want to do this and the only thing I can think is, you know, it's all, it's all from my family just to, you know, keep things going. You know, my wife and my kids, you know, provide a life for them. We love the cows, we love the work, and that doesn't change, even if it's hard times. So there's, you're never out of work on a dairy farm. You're, there's always plenty to do, and uh, it's, it's what we love. Over a century and a half of devotion and dedication to the land, animals, and the people that call this farm home. That's the Sunderland family, the 2020 Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year. In Bridport, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thank you, Keith. The winner of the Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year Award is honored annually at the Big E in West Springfield, Massachusetts, as part of the New England Green Pastures Award Program. The Big E has been canceled due to the pandemic, but organizers hope to honor the Sunderland family at the Big E in 2021, alongside next year's winners. Which is a good reminder, it's never too early to nominate a farm for the award. Anyone can put forth a nomination for the Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year. The program is organized by University of Vermont Extension, and you can download a nomination form at the website that's on your screen. Once again, our congratulations to the Sunderland family of Bridport, the 2020 Vermont Dairy Farm of the Year. And that is our program for today. We know you have choices, so thanks for choosing us. I'm Will Michael, inviting you to join us back here each weekday afternoon for another visit Across the Fence. Okay, that was great. We were in uh, northern New England and had a tour of uh, the Sunderland Farm in Bridport, and uh, now we're going to move down to Connecticut. And so uh, I, uh, I'd like to see if uh, Brian Hurlbert is uh, on the – there There he is. Okay, so Brian, if you'd like to say a few words, uh, we'll turn the microphone over to you. Oh, well, I, I guess timing is everything in these, yeah. uh, these things. So um, uh, just want to say thank you to Green Pastures for um, finding a way to recognize some great farms across New England um, in, a, in the COVID world and make sure that we didn't lose um, what's very important and, and acknowledging that um, for the, what was it, almost 70, 70 years, 70 plus years, um, that Green Pastures has been um, honoring uh, New England dairy farmers that uh, we found a way to do it in, in a virtual manner. Um, also want to extend my uh, congratulations to the Learned family for 
um, taking on a really difficult job in, a, in, a, in the best of times and making sure that they were producing a high quality product um, for the consumers in the state of Connecticut and the region um, and finding a way to make it work. It's, uh, it's always difficult. It's more difficult during COVID times. Um, but the fact that they have their entire family involved is something to be said about their, the sense of community and family that they have. Um, and it's just nice to be able to find uh, a way to recognize some really great people um, on an otherwise uh, you know, challenging year. So congratulations um, to you all and to Gary and Sheila for nominating them. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Sheila, can we uh, get you to come on and introduce the farm family? Yes, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Commissioner, for being here. We really appreciate it. And thank you also to Gary and the committee to make, for making this happen. I think this is an exciting way to deal with our situation right now. And finally, congratulations to all the farms. And it is my pleasure to introduce the Connecticut Farm of the Year for New England Green Pastures. And it is the Learned family. And they are two brothers, Tim and Ben. And they are first generation dairy farmers, which is kind of unusual in this day and age. Um, they started out with a couple of cows as youngsters, and they have built their herd up to 120 cows, high quality herd, high quality milk. And the, um, the committee that went to visit them was just impressed at their ability to be able to develop a farm that quickly. But what really um, caught the committee's eye is their passion. They're happy every day. They work together as brothers. They work together in all aspects of the farm. They're happy to get up and work. They have other family members helping them. They have a passion. And gee, every time I talk to Ben, it's just like a, a shot in the arm of talking to somebody who loves what he does. And with that, I'd like to have you listen to the Learned Families Farm, which is in North Stonington, Connecticut. The name of the farm is Valley View Farm. Okay, uh, Ben, uh, before we start the presentation, if you have any comments or your brother has any comments you'd like to say before we uh, load up the PowerPoint, uh, you've got the microphone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Ben Learned, and this is my brother, Tim Learned. And uh, we would just want to thank everyone for uh, choosing us. We're so honored to be chosen for uh, the Green Pastures Award this year. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into our passion and our farm, and we're just really thankful. Okay, so we're gonna load the presentation and just tell me when to change the slides, okay? Sure. Okay, we should be right there. So this opening slide is uh, an aerial shot of our farm. And um, you can see the main lactating barn um, directly behind the grain silos out front. The hay shed that we store our dry bales is uh, to the left. Um, calf hutches behind the barn and a nice beautiful 25 acre cornfield behind that. Um, we've done a lot of uh, remodeling inside the barn uh, without ever changing the footprint. Um, We've gone from milking 30 head in here to about 120. Um, we've just utilized every square inch and put free stalls wherever we could. And um, I guess our motto is just to never stop trying to improve. Ready for the next slide? Yes. And so uh, we're located in southeastern Connecticut in North Stonington. The star is... Uh, pretty accurate. We're right on the Connecticut, Rhode Island border. And um, it's been pretty dry this year. All the thunderstorms seem to drift just north of that. <laughs> this is uh, a picture of our family. Uh, in the middle, you, you can see my father, Ed Learned, and my mother, Belinda. And to the left of that is uh, our sister, Marcia, and her two kids, Bradley and Annalise. My brother, Tim, is on the far left. My wife and I are to the right of Ed Learned, and uh, my sister-in-law, Liz Lewis, is furthest to the right. And uh, everyone in that picture really plays a part in what we do here. Um, from my parents first purchasing this farm, 
to uh, my brother and I leaving our careers after college to start milking cows and my wife who helps in the mornings before work and my sister-in-law and uh, just really everyone there really helps keep this place going. So in this picture, you can see our tractor and planter. We're planting corn behind the barn. Um, it's a six row planter. And in recent years, we've adopted more minimal tillage and no-till planting. Um, we really think it's better for erosion purposes. Um, what were you gonna say? And so we plant about 120 acres of corn and uh, again, like I said, we never, we try to never stop improving. So switching to no-till for a lot of our fields has really saved a lot of uh, time, diesel fuel, and it's better for the soil, so. And in this picture, you can see uh, our manure spreader. We fed our stalls with sand, which is very comfortable for the cows, but it's tricky to manage the manure. Uh, so we spread manure on good days and stockpile it in the summer when the fields are full of uh, growing crops and uh, on bad weather days. Just uh, trying to do what we can for nutrient management. And um, we're always looking forward to, and we're really looking forward to putting in a more intensive manure management program with maybe a sand separator and uh, liquid manure. Yes. In this shot, um, this is uh, up at my parents' farm, which is up the road from Valley View Dairy here. Uh, they have 110 acres up there, and we raise beef, ve uh, veal, pork, chickens. My sister, Marsha, raises uh, over 1,000 broiler chickens a year and has 300 laying hens going at any given time. Um, she also raises 100 turkeys for Thanksgiving. And uh, there's really a lot going on at my parents' farm too. That's uh, Stony Ledge is the name of that farm. And so my sister will come in the morning and help milk and then go uh, up to Stony Ledge and take care of the chickens and the gardens. Uh, we do CSA shares. Um, and it's just really a lot that's going on that all works together too. Uh, Valley View produces a lot of the feed for the beef up at Stony Ledge. And uh, my brother and I manage the beef herd up there. Um, it's just really a neat uh, environment. In this picture, uh, we're round baling hay. We make uh, wet wrap round bales, kind of like long stem haylage. And um, this field in particular is kind of far from the farm. So we'll try to mow it and let it dry for a day or two and roll it without having to handle it too much. And that makes pretty good feed for the beef to carry them through the winter. In this shot, we're mowing more hay and uh, we've upgraded our uh, fleet of mowing equipment over the years from uh, an open station 3010 John Deere with a seven foot sickle bar. to now we run two disc binds and uh, having limited time in between milkings, having two disc binds really helps with downtime. And if my brother and I are both mowing, we can mow hay twice as fast and uh, get back here to milking. And uh, in the first presentation, they talked about milking robots. And that's something that we would really like to uh, look into installing so that we could have more time to focus on crops during the day and just really expand our work day. We hire uh, a custom harvesting crew, the Spielman farm, to chop our corn in the fall. And um, we really feel that that allows us to access higher quality feed at a modest price. They're great to deal with and they do a fantastic job. Um, they've really, I mean, they're really partners. Um, we've learned so much from the Spielmans about how to grow good corn, how to properly harvest it, store it, uh, pack it. Um, it's just a really great thing to be able to have uh, other farms that are just so helpful because starting out, we didn't know what we were doing. We weren't born farmers and we've just tried to learn uh, in all the years since 2009, which is when we started, we've just always tried to improve.
in this picture we're installing this spring we decided that our small thousand gallon bulk tank was limiting our production and future growth so this spring just before the pandemic started we thought it was a great time to switch to a we bought a used 2700 gallon tank which would allow us to go on every other day milk pickup and free up time and make it better to cool the milk so here we are demoing our milk room floor and we have our old little tank just outside of our foundation and uh, i'm standing on top of the floor wire that we're patiently waiting to pour concrete on so we can put our new bulk tank in and we're hoping that that will be phase one of our robot expansion we raise our calves in calf hutches it helps isolate them from bacteria and viruses we've been very hands-on we're not we're not quite group oriented as well as we should be and we feel that a hands-on approach allows us to give the best care and best health for the animal and it's i just i enjoy it so i feed the calves and i feel like they're at some days they're my children and they're the best thing that we have is because a, a healthy calf is the start of that rest of a healthy herd for the rest of us and those babies are our future so i feel like they're the most important animal on our farm but everyone's opinions vary. <laughs> uh, in this shot you can see our flat six milking parlor this is how we milk our 120 head uh twice a day um, when we first started there was only one machine in between each set of two cows and over the years we've added uh, two machines so that it's quicker it's very labor intensive but it's actually very efficient time wise uh, it takes about three hours to milk 120 head because you can release one cow individually and replace her without needing to let a whole group go um, so although i mean it is hard on the backs and the knees it's not too bad to uh, put 120 cows through twice a day and they're very comfortable uh, i've seen some older parlors where the cows are pinched because cows have grown over the years through breeding and a larger framed cow. And I uh, just noticed how happy and calm our cows are while they're being milked in here. Uh, in this shot, we're loading our mixer wagon with a skid steer. We uh, mix the TMR with corn silage, uh, haylage, and um, one, uh, one mixed grist. Um, we use the vertical mixer wagon to shorten the stock length on our haylage because we use the round bales we don't chop our haylage and uh, it really makes a nice ration so we can have high quality milk um, we use high quality feed ingredients and that really translates to high components for our herd um, we consistently have high butter fat protein and low somatic cell counts and the mixer wagon was really one of the best investments we ever made uh, we started out mixing feed at the face of the pile and over the years when uh, we purchased the mixer wagon it was one of our first big investments and we said oh man how are we ever going to pay for this and i really feel like it's paid for itself from day one okay any last comments i would just like to say thank you again for selecting us for uh the green pastures award this year we're really very honored and uh, it means a lot to us. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for sharing your farm with uh, everybody in attendance. We've got uh, quite a big group of people um, from all over the region, so that's uh, fantastic. Okay, next we're going to move to Maine with the Lowell Family Farm in Buckfield, and uh, we're going to start. I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Amanda Beal if she would like to make a few comments about the farm. Sure. Uh, thank you, first of all, to everyone who made this event possible. Uh, it's really good to be together with the aid of technology when it works well, and it seems to be working well tonight, so that's wonderful. Um, of course, it's not the same as being in person, but it's, it's nice to see you all and be here with you all for such a wonderful occasion. I, as all of us feel, I'm sure uh, dairy is such an important sector of agriculture, and I don't just say that because I, I grew up on a dairy farm in Maine, but I know how hard all of you work day in and day out, and I just want to congratulate everyone, all of the farmers, for being recognized tonight. 
And of course, I want to uh, especially express heartfelt congratulations to the Lowells on behalf of all of us at the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry for being this year's recipient of the 2020 Maine Dairy Farm of the Year Award. You are so deserving. It's clear that you've taken great care in building and managing your operation in a way that truly exemplifies best practices on all fronts. From putting cow comfort and health at the center to your ongoing commitment to practices that protect soil health like cover cropping and all while working as a family to run a viable and productive dairy farm that produces a very high quality product. We are so proud to have dairy farmers like you in our state setting such a great example. So enjoy this well-earned award and know that we are all celebrating along with you at the department. Congratulations once again to everyone and to the Lowell Family Farm. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, now I'm gonna call on Rick Kersbergen to introduce the family, the, win the winning family. Well, thanks, Gary, thanks. Um, and, it, and it's been interesting in the selection process. This is the first time that I've been involved in the selection process and unfortunately we didn't get to visit the farms and we had four exceptional farms to choose from as, as finalists this year. Um, and, and we did this via Zoom just like we're doing tonight. And um, I think some of the judges from our selection process are on tonight and they, they can probably agree with me that all four of our candidates this year were exceptional. But the Lowells really stood out for a number of practices. And, you know, I always say if, if I was a cow, I'd want to live at the Lowells because cow comfort is one of their primary goals. And back in 2010, when they started, they built a, a bedded pack dairy barn from an old horse arena. Um, you know, I, I shook my head a few times when I visited, but boy, did they build a beautiful facility that really focuses on cow comfort and quality milk. And, and you can see it when you go visit that farm if you ever get the chance to do that. But the other thing that really stood out um, is, is their commitment to forage quality. And when we looked at some of the analysis on our, our judging team, and we saw that some of their haylage actually tested out an energy that would rival many corn silage samples, we knew that we had a winner in terms of the quality feed that they put up. And so, um, you know, once we saw that and we, you know, understood how dedicated they are to focusing on forage quality, which really is, you know, the key to producing quality and economic milk in the state of Maine. Yeah, the Lowell's really stood out as this year's winners. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to, to Dana and Sari, and we'll uh, hear about their farm. Yeah, Dana and Sari, do you have any comments that you'd like to make before we get to the slides? Well, I think we'd just like to say Thank you. Thank like, you. As everyone has, uh, it really is an honor. And when we see these other farms, it certainly seems like more of an honor to be included in such a, a group. So thank you. It, it means quite a bit, a lot to us. Okay, so just let me know when to uh, change the slides. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is our main cow facility on North Hill road in Buckfield, Maine. Uh, in this building, which is an old riding arena, we house our milking herd, the dry cows, and the bred heifers. Okay. And uh, we started shipping milk actually in 2007 out of a, a rented Thai barn, which was a learning experience. We figured out pretty quickly we didn't want to milk in a Thai barn. And uh, after three years of uh, pushing 400 yards of concrete around and a lot of thinking, uh, we started shipping milk from this current facility on North Hill. And it, and it didn't take us long to realize that our focus really needed to be on cow comfort and quality forages. Uh, those two things go hand in hand. One complements the other, and there's a synergy that you have there that translates into whether you're milking Jersey's like us or Holstein's, translates into a higher component milk and more efficient cows. Okay. Now here's all the people that make it happen. Uh, that's me holding an enormous calf. I can barely handle it. And to my right is my daughter, Marin. She is as strong as she looks. 
And there's my son, Wheeler, and he is as meticulous as he looks. And that's my wife, Sari, to the right. And we work hand in hand, doing both physical work and managing the farm. At the lower left, there's Josh Fournier, who is, uh, he's everything to us. He's been with us since the beginning. It's a long story, but he's amazing. He's everywhere on the farm and he can do anything. Our vet, Kelsey Hilton, we love her. She's gentle, thoughtful, really good with the animals. Michelle Bennett, a nutritionist, nutritionist. she's uh, had great advice. She loves the cows. She loves a well-fed, healthy cow. And there's, uh, there's Nate Kassaboom, who's a uh, breeding tech. He's uh, full of knowledge and really gets cows bred and Ann Harrington, the DHI technician who has helped us problem solve a lot of situations with the herd. Okay. Now here in the barn, which used to be the arena, is the bedded pack. And it's not unusual to come into this barn and see most of the cows are lying down. We've milked up towards 100 in this barn. We recently downsized, which is going pretty well. But you can see they're lying down. And as I said, it's not unusual to see them all resting. And, uh, you know, it has worked really well for us. Rarely do you see a cow walking uh, unsteady. It, you know, the only time you see it if they had a recent heat or something. But uh, we recently trimmed all the hooves and there wasn't a single abscess, uh, no hairy heel and we've never had to use a foot bath. Okay. Now the, the, the pack, uh, we've had really good luck with it. It was a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, and while it does take a fair bit of bedding, uh, maintaining it is really easy. Uh, the pack area is 40 by uh, 100, almost 150 and 20 minutes to a half hour a day you can keep it aerated and and dry, and you can you can see that the, the before tilling on the bottom center and the after tilling, uh, just how dry and comfortable that would be to lie in. Okay. Now managing the pack uh, it, it is a challenge, and there's lots of aspects you got to keep track of. You know the, the cabin. The, the carbon inputs, the cow density, but the airflow, that big fan on the left, uh, it, it works um, in conjunction with everything else we do with the pack. Keeping that air flowing over the pack keeps that surface dry, which keeps the cows clean. And of course the fan keeps the cows comfortable. As you can see to the right, we miss the cows. Uh, which keeps them standing there eating longer. Uh, nothing's more pleasing on a 90 degree day to come up and see your cows either lying down or looking like, you know, oil drums still standing there eating. Okay. Now you can see if you, on the left, that temperature, my wife, Sari, she just uh, walked up and put that thermometer in the first place he came to on the pack. It's 130 degrees, and that seems really alarming. Like you, you're not going to need a cow to lie down on that during the day, uh, especially hot weather. Uh, but with the fans and the misters, uh, those cows, it's it's got to be a heat index of over 95, where you don't go up and find them lying down uh, in the summertime during the day. Uh, and in the winter, oh, in the, <laughs> I really love it. Well, in the winter, it's a little bit more of a challenge. You have to get some dry bedding mixed in. And and there was a learning curve, but we generally can keep that pack over 100 degrees in the winter time, which uh, keeps the uh, uh, mastitis causing pathogens uh, at bay. And, you know, there's other aspects that are positive, like the, the, the group, and it allows our bred heifers, you can see on the right, to get to know the milk cows before we actually have to put them in the same pen together, which makes those uh, transitions a lot easier. Because you don't just have physical comfort, they're social animals, so you get to think about that too. And of course the pack, you got 
the full range of cow behavior. Uh, they don't go out on pasture, but you will see them running around. And as, as you can see, heat detection is not an issue. Okay. And all that comfort and all that good feed, I think, helps. You know, these numbers show in terms of the average day in milk. It's pretty good. Uh, it has been lower before. Uh, but, uh, you know, a conception rate of 43%, we're really, really happy with that. And uh, our bull selection, uh, well, you can see, we we like the small jersey. We, we, you know, we don't, well, not to be disparaging, we aren't Holstein wannabes. I know a lot of people love a big cow, but we like the small, compact version of the cow. And in fact, we try to model our farming behaviors and systems around the efficiency of those Jersey cows because they're small and uh, they do a lot of work. Okay. Now, for us, I think the, uh, the last present just talked about the, the importance of those little calves. Cow comfort begins with calf comfort. And we, we, have, we keep our calves in group housing uh, for the last four or five years now. And uh, it's, we've really loved it. They've been really happy. Okay. Now you see it's an open barn, lots of light, good ventilation. And again, we keep fans going on these calves. If it's over 70 degrees, we're cooling them down. And you see in the upper left corner with the automatic calf feeder, they've got food available. Uh, 24 7 and uh, uh, every cow we're milking now has gone through this barn and uh, uh, we're really happy okay he has a double seven uh, pile as it come in at uh, 70 degrees we build it ourselves we built a superstructure ourselves we had professional help setting up the the milk lines and stuff, but uh, we we did all that work, work ourselves. Okay. Now you can see, uh, I think this is where you can see where everything's paying off. The components uh, really, rarely go, the butterfat really goes below uh, 5%, five percent. you can see on the, from the graph on the left hand side. And the protein always stays high. In fact, now that it's cooled down a little bit, we're quickly approaching 5.5% on butter fat and uh, almost 4% on protein. And our SEC has actually come down uh, from what that graph on the right indicates. Okay. So you can see some of the other aspects of our operations. Uh, we feed a partial, a partial TMI and uh, you push up regularly two, three, sometimes four times a day. With us, uh, again, that high quality forage keeps them at the bunk eating, but we also like to put up really nice dry hay because uh, you know that room and pack is really important to us. And we'll top dress with nice dry hay twice a day. That hay that's getting fed out right there is like 18% protein with a mega cows of about light corn. Uh, and again, uh, with the headlocks, we can on the lower right, you can see, uh, not entirely see, but uh, we can individually grain. So we, you know, our high cows can get a little bit more and the low cows get quite a bit less, but we don't average uh, barely 19 pounds of grain per cow. And on the lower left, you can see everything's compact, like the Jersey cow. We got the uh, dry cows on the right, red heifers on the immediate left, and the milk cows further down. And in just a few minutes, you can feed those cows up for the day. Okay. So that's our mix. Uh, it's a little more than that right now, but the proportions are all the same. If you go through those numbers, you can, you'll find that it's actually a little lower in protein, what a lot of people would do, but we've really been emphasizing the energy. And, um, it, it seems to be really working well for us. The cows look really good. Uh, people can't believe how much flesh is on their bones for what they're doing. Okay. 
as you can see, they're diving in. Uh, most any time of the day, if you go out and throw out some dry hay, they'll, if they're up there lying down, they'll come down and eat some. Okay. Now here, I just want to say briefly, uh, we love the land and that's one of the reasons we went into it. All four of these fields, when we took them over about 12 years ago, they were essentially full of bed straw, goldenrod, and milkweed with a few other weeds that I didn't know what were. So we found out about the importance of high quality forage from not having it and having to build a base. Every, we didn't have a single acre that wasn't pretty much run out when we started. And now we're farming uh, between the corn and the grass, 300 acres. And uh, some of these fields will mow four times a year. Okay. There's a feed sample. Uh, it's, you know, that's pretty indicative. It's not too unusual for us to have feed like that. And we, our goal is to have quality feed like that that we can feed to both our milk cows and our growing heifers. Okay. Once again, different fields. Now these last two feed samples, I just want to say real quick, I'm probably, I don't want to go over and waste people's time. But going back to those four fields that were pictured, uh, that represents about uh, 60 or 70 acres. And we have three, three mowers. And uh, like the first crop, we went out and mowed uh, those 60 or 70 acres one day and we tended it out to dry it for hay. Then the next day we went out and did another 20 acres, that first seed feed sample for uh, baleage. And the day after that, we did another 20 acres of baleage. And then the, the, the third day we baled that a bunch of nice dry hay. And uh, having those three mowers and being able to go out and mow 20 acres in less than two hours uh, it actually allows us to mow later in the day at like 11 so that it's wilted down. We have the pressure taken off our conditioner rolls and it's wide swath. And by going out later in the day and be able to mow a lot, we can get it dried down to that, uh, you know, 33, 35% dry matter, which our cows really love. And then it's four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, the just that time of day will help maintain that moisture level because my cows our cows once they get up over 40 percent dry matter they they won't eat nearly as much so we work really hard to give them what they want okay and uh we do all no-till we do cover crop in the past we've had really good luck with a longer day corn this year we tried something different, hoping it'd be better for the ground. We went with a shorter day corn, want to give the cover crop more time to uh, grow and suck up more of those nutrients and put the root systems out. But it's been a really weird year for us. Our 69 day corn is drying down slower than our 85 day corn. And we're actually not gonna harvest it until the middle of this coming week. Okay. And we've, you know, we've got a lot of NICS projects. This is an erosional control project in a field that was actually sold into development, but thanks to the 2008 financial crisis, it never got put in. And uh, five or six years ago, I just called the guy up to see what he was ever gonna do with that. And he was tickled to death to sell it to us at a pretty good price. And it's only a half mile from the farm but there was some serious washing and some real serious belly formation and the uh, NICS is helping us, uh, you know, basically reclaiming it, reclaim it and uh, control the future erosion. Okay. And that's it. <laughs> Once again, we'd like to thank you all. And we, hmm? I think I can speak for both of us and my entire family that uh, we truly are honored to be part of the very honored this group thank you well thank you very much dana and siri 
and we'll uh, stop sharing the screen and come back to to you and uh, then we'll uh, have Elena shift back to me. Maybe. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll move on to the next uh, family, and uh, we're going to move to New Hampshire, to Nottaville Farm in North Conway, New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. And so we're going to start by asking Sean Jasper if he's got a few comments uh, from the Department of Agriculture. So, Commissioner Jasper. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for being part of this. It's of course, for all of us, it's disappointing not to uh, be down at the Big E, but I'm really pleased that uh, this program was put together, and it's uh, so far been a great format, um, and it's been a nice way to to be able to see what everybody is uh, is up to. I think uh, the Hussey family's got a great story to to tell, and um, I love the name of the farm. That's uh, that's really quite unique. Not a veil farm. It's uh, interesting. I hope they tell the story of, of that. There must be one behind it. And um, I also hope that uh, I get an invitation up to the farm sometime soon. I've never never been up there, and uh, look forward to it. Congratulations to all the winners tonight, and uh, look forward to being with everyone down at the Big E next year. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. John Porter is going to introduce the farm family. And so if John can come on. Hey, thank you, Gary. Uh, first of all, I just want to echo the thank you to the donors. Uh, I accepted a lot of the registrations and the checks this year that are mailed directly to my house and really encouraged by all the notes of support and everything. And almost every envelope, I had a check in it. In fact, I just want to update the donors today. Another a uh, generous silver award came in from Stonyfield Organics uh, via Jason Johnson, our farm rep. And uh, everybody's just been so generous and it made it fun to go to the mailbox. But I want to introduce our winners, uh, Justin and Julie Huzzy, and also with their family, Sawyer and Allie. As you heard, it's not a veal farm in North Conway, New Hampshire, uh, at the base of the White Mountains. Uh, I've known Justin and Julie since they were college students at UNH. I knew Justin's father. I knew Justin's grandfather. And I know this couple has worked really hard with the goal of trying to buy back the family farm out of the estate. They've done that, and they have a great story to tell. So let's turn it over to them. Okay, Julie and Justin, if, before we load up the slides, if you've got a couple of comments. Uh, and, and the Husseys are almost a main farm. They're only a couple of miles away. So um, so if we have uh, Julie Hussey, there we go. Did you have a, your, your, there you go, your microphone's okay now. So do you have a few comments you want to start with before we uh, start the slides or do you want to move right into the slides? No, I mean, like everybody else, we're obviously very honored to uh, to be to receive this award, um, uh, everybody obviously has been very deserving of the award, and and um, you know just just honored and and glad we were recognized. And um, from where we you know doesn't seem like we've been doing it that long, but I guess I guess we've been doing it longer than we thought. And we have a lot of gray hairs to show yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that's probably because I've been married to you. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll load the slide. Just tell me when you want to switch to the next slide. Well, um, so that's a picture, obviously, of of uh, our family in front of the farm sign out in front. Um, of the road, uh, of the road. Um, my wife, my boy Sawyer is, uh, 14, 13, 13, sorry, and my daughter Allie's 14. Um, oh, quick 
thought on the 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 farming not real farm uh, when we started farming in 2003 I guess uh, we didn't really have a farm name. We were renting from my grandfather at the time. Um, and so our friends down, well, back up. We, uh, we had a lot of trouble running by the road. We're the only farm in in our area really uh dairy farm for sure and so we were raising calves and hutches uh that's how we started actually raising for julie's brother and there was some animal activists local animal activists that we were raising veal calves in hutches, not dairy calves, which they didn't really know the difference anyways. But uh, so we were constantly being bombarded with that we were cruel to animals and we were raising veal calves to kill them and uh, so, Not just an animal activist, a crazy lady animal activist. Yeah. So she went all. Uh, she went to everybody in the state trying to get us shut down. Um, so our friends at the tire shop, I had, uh, we had a tractor tire down the tire shop, and we didn't have a farm name yet, and they didn't know what to put on the bill. And, they're good friends of ours, and uh, we all joke that we're sick of telling everybody that no, we're not a veal farm, we're, we're, a, we're a dairy farm, or a pepper raising farm at the time. And uh, so he just wrote on top of the, of the bill, not a veal farm. So that's where we just change the letters a little bit. And that's where the farm name came from. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so you can go on to the next slide, I guess, and we can start talking about the farm. Uh, can we change the slide, or do I have to do that? Gary? Is, is that the... I have a picture of the of the farm or the farmhouse. Is that the or do you want the next one? Can we can we change the slide? Can you hear us? <laughs> Maybe she can call me. I guess not. So I'll just keep talking. Um, <laughs> I don't think she'll keep talking. Hello? Can anybody hear us? Yep, we can hear we can hear you now. No. Okay. What what do you uh, see on the what do you see on the screen? Can can we turn turn the slide? Turn the slide. <laughs> What's going on? Turn the Hello? slide. Hello? <laughs> can anybody hear us? Can anybody us? hear us? We can hear you. We can hear you. Gary, they want you to can change you the slide. Can you wave if you can hear us? Yeah, I think there we go. Okay. Hear you. Yes. So this is uh, so this is the farm, obviously from the road. Um, my grandfather purchased the farm in the early. Yeah. No, that's perfect. That's can you perfect. hear us? Yep. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes, we can. Okay. I bet she's all worked out. Yeah, we're we're good now. I just we didn't seem like anybody could hear you couldn't hear us. Yeah, I wondered if we should so, turn the camera. Uh the like I said, my grandfather bought the farm in the early sixties. 
Um, we purchased the farm out of the family in 2013. Um, we started dairying in 2007 at uh, Sherman Farm in East Conway. Uh, we bought uh, the cows. They're so far behind. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, we, we, in 2007, we started farming at uh, Sherman facility. And then um, we milked about 100 cows. We milked about 100 cows there. Um, and then the opportunity came for us to purchase the farm out of the family that my grandfather started. There was no, uh, I can't even tell if I want to play. I don't know, we have 100% human Wi Fi. The host is still our video. I don't know what's going on. I'm not talking anymore. Yeah, but I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> Anyways, I guess go to the next video or next slide. I don't know what's going on right now. I don't know if I should keep talking. Or I just, I would just log out. This is awful. This is embarrassing. I don't know what's going on. I think we can all hear you. So we put in tunnel ventilation. I don't know if you can hear us, but anyways, we put in tunnel ventilation. Um, in the old barn that was built in the early 60s, and it was an old Agway style barn. It was all closed up. Um, so it had insulated ceiling. Um, so we, we put in, uh, we put in on John's actually recommendation, he came to the farm and um, help us make some recommendations on how we could get better airflow in these old tight barns. Uh, so we put in these fans out to pull and took the wall off the back side of the barn uh, that pulled a, uh, the prevailing air through the barn. Um, we kept to keep the doors closed on the front, obviously, uh, in the summer to keep, uh, to keep that airflow going through. Um, and uh, what else? Emily, we put in all new stalls, uh, made them bigger, made them wider. Um, it's not a drive. We have to push the cows around while we're milking to, uh, to feed um, and scrape the barn. Um, and let's go to the next slide. So, so uh, we're located in the river valley of the of Mount Washington. One of the challenges we have at our farm is uh, a lot of tourism in the summer, and about half of our land we crop about 600 acres, and about half of our land is on the other side of the river from the farm. So we have to do. Uh, we have to deal with the traffic, the North Conway's traffic, and it might only be six miles, but it could take an hour round trip to uh, whether we're chopping corn or chopping grass in our land in North Conway. Uh, we, it, it's good land, uh, so you know we, we have good crop yields. Um, we have implemented a lot of no-till. I do the majority of the crop, uh, the, the crop work. Um, so anything I can do to save time uh, is is beneficial. So obviously, uh, and and because we have a, usually flooding at least once a year in the spring, um, so anything we can do to help not disturb uh, the soil uh, to keep to keep from eroding down the river um, is helpful. Uh, we planted about 250 acres of corn this year. The rest is all grass. Um, we have a little bit of pasture, but not much. Next slide, please. Uh, so the calves, our calves are raised in hutches in 
about three quarters of the year. Uh, we do get a lot of snow and a lot of wind um, being in the mountains area that we are at. Uh, in the winter time, uh, well, when snow when snow starts, we put the calves in the old uh, tie barn, which obviously doesn't sound good at all, but. Uh, we manage it fairly well. They're the only things in there, and we use the fences to keep them separated so they can't touch. Um, it just makes it, it makes a little better environment for the calves. Um, like I said, we only do that for a few months a year. They then move on to the, the super hutches, and from the super hutches, they go into the heifer barn. Um, my wife takes care of and she's in charge of basically all the health of calves and cows, and we kind of split the breeding. Um, we both we both somewhat do that. Uh, lately in the summer, she's done more of it because I'm busy doing field work. Next slide, please. So this is the heifer barn out back. So from the super hutches, they go to the heifer barn. Uh, it's a 180 stall barn. Um, we've got it separated into uh, one, two, three, four, five groups, um, right up until uh, we go to pre-fresh. Well, um, we we we've got a one-group uh, dry cow just because of the, our facility restrictions, so we don't have a pre-fresh anymore. So we try to move our uh, our heifers three weeks pre-partum into the dry cow group, so they can start getting um, grain and getting mixed in with the with the milk uh, with the dry cows um, so this was so th this was our old barn retrofit well, I guess you could say um, we do not have a manure pit which is a obviously not a great situation we push the manure down to the end of the barn during milking then load into a spreader we field stack uh, or field stack out back in the winter time and then uh, we spread whenever we can, obviously. Uh, we do quite a bit of haying because that's part of our other business. And uh, so that staggers our cutting so we're able to spread, uh, spread more than just once a month. We're, we have two groups. Well, we have three groups now. We have a high, low, and a first calf heifer group. The first calf heifer group we implemented this winter, so this uh, the dairy barn was a was an H barn with the milking center in the middle, and when we when we first bought the farm out of the family, uh, we didn't utilize this section of the barn that you're looking at now just for financial reasons. Really, we just couldn't uh, we just didn't have to, couldn't renovate that barn and the other barn at the same time. We do most all the work ourselves. Uh, Headlocks are used. Uh, so we've had we've had used free stalls in the past. We we make our own gates. Um, we try. We've obviously tried to do as much much work as we can uh, ourselves. And we did all the work to renovate this barn. So as you can see, at the far end of the barn is the dry cows with a neck rail, and on this end of the barn is the first calf heifer group which has really helped um, our first calf chapters. They struggled in the high group, uh, competing with the larger cows in bunk space. And now there's the first calf heifers have, there's plenty of feed space and plenty of stall space. Yeah, there's 36 stalls and there's usually less than 36 animals in there. So uh, that's, it's definitely, definitely helped. It's helped our repro in that group as well. So that's just the uh, old the old holding area. We've got a double six parlor. Um, it we like the old parlors. That you know that parlor was built in '63, uh, I think, somewhere in that vicinity. So it was small. Uh, we made the stalls and everything a little bit bigger. It's a herringbone parlor. Um, we put in automatic takeoffs when we moved in. Uh, we had to put in, uh, we put in two 
bulk tanks since then are used bulk tanks. One's 2,500 gallons, the other one's 1,600. Um, we have a hospital uh, pen or a breeding pen right outside the parlor so our milker uh, can catch cows for us to breed or to be helpful. Um, we've added a lot of fans. There wasn't really any fans in the barns when we, when we took it over. So uh, trying to do that type of stuff for cow comfort is, uh, is always a challenge for us in these old barns. So there's a picture of the barrel where we... Double six. Yeah, it's a double six, sorry. The uh, typo there, it's a, it's a double six herringbone parlor. Uh, we've got Bomatic, uh, older Bomatic takeoff units. When we moved from Sherman's, we took uh, the units with us from there, and then we added uh, we added some more units. Um, for the for its age, it kind of had a wider uh, uh, a wider pit, which was nice. Um, open open to the south side so you get sun in the morning uh, so it wasn't a complete dungeon like some of the older parlors were which uh, which is helpful we've in, we've helped with the lighting too there are two bulk tanks just the milk room uh, nothing special there just uh, we've we've swapped a lot of tanks in the past we we came we left Sherman's uh, with two tanks, put them in, have since taken them out and put two other tanks in. Um, I'm not a dairy tech, uh, a dairy tech, but I'm pretty good at putting in, putting in and taking out tanks now. Uh, so we started, uh, we've started a little self sort farm store, um, just trying to regain some retail market. We do some raw milk, beef, pork, um, we obviously would like to keep expanding that uh, in the future because we really, um, you know, milking 200 cows just isn't, you know, we just know long term that's not going to be probably viable. So uh, we need to, we, and we do, well, we do a lot of other things too, um, but this is where we're headed for the future, I guess. Uh, so like I said, one some of the other things we do. So we do say we do uh, bale quite a bit of hay. We use some round bales for the heifers, uh, but we also sell a lot of hay. Um, we we sell round bales. We have some a uh, few beef customers that buy buy round bales from us. Um, just helps keep that cash flow going year round. Um, we also do. Quite a few small square bales. Uh, I have a feed store that takes a tractor trail load of hay every other week, um, and we have some other small, smaller customers that take square bales. Uh, growing up, I always thought um, I, I did a lot of square bale and uh, old style, picking them up in the field and stacking them and stacking them in the barn for my grandfather. And I said, I'll never, you know, when I grow up, I'll never do this, and here I am still doing it. But it's pretty good money, and it helps keep the dairy surviving. He has to keep doing it to feed his horses. <laughs> uh, so the barn, so the farm had two, uh, had two harvesters when we got here, obviously. Um, we have utilized one of them. We, we invested uh, some money in, into uh, improving one of them. We use it for high moisture shell corn which we have a grinder that we grind and blow um, the corn in the silo. So we really don't buy any energy on the farm. So whatever we, whatever energy we can't reach, uh, retrieve from our corn silage, uh, we, we use the high moisture shell corn. So it eliminates having to buy cornmeal because um, we do have good corn growing ground here. So it's it's a pretty good savings, uh, it, and it works better in the diet I feel than the than than the snapflage, um, and the nutritionist seems to like it a lot better, and uh, doesn't take up a lot of space, and it's yeah, well, it's it saved us a lot of money over the last six years. And you harvest it after you're done everything else. Uh, so we've got two, uh, we've got a haylage bunk, corn bunk, obviously. Uh, our haylage bunk 65 wide, 200 feet long. We usually split it down the middle to have not quite as big a face. Um, the haylage bunk is, I think, is only 40 feet wide and 150 feet long, so it's not quite as big. Um, we really try. I'm kind of the feed guy. I try to do a good job of feeding. 
Um, we, that's really the only way I feel like in the dairy industry today is where you really, nobody can make more money because you're all getting paid pretty much the same for milk. So it's how much can you save? And the, our biggest cost obviously is grain. And so whatever the, the better quality I feed I put up is the more money we save. So therefore the more money we make. Uh, we feed, we have a mixer wagon, obviously. Uh, we have two skid steers, one for feeding, one for manure. Um, we use, uh, we've started implementing using the vapor barrier under the plastic. Uh, virtually hardly any spoilage, if any at all, um, in our in our forages now. Um, like I said, on the corn, we do we still do we do quite a bit of no-till. Uh, we've cut back our our day length to about mid 80s. Uh, just trying to get the corn done a little bit sooner. Um, we can we can have a pretty early frost here, so that's hit that's nipped us in the butt a couple times. So I've cut the day length down, and really, <coughs> it's really. Um, it, it may have, we may have lost a little bit in tonnage, but we, I do not think, I, well, I know we haven't lost any in quality. Our, we, our starches usually run around high 30s to 40. Um, protein is in our, in our haylage is uh, 17 to 20, depending on the cutting. Um, and so we were, we, one of our, one of our holdups was our chopping. Um, we have done custom in the past. We're a little bit out of the way, which makes it a challenge. We had a pull behind chopper for a long time, and we uh, we bought a self propelled chopper this year, and uh, glad we did. It's it's probably one of the best investments we've ever made. So uh, Julie does. Uh, my wife Julie does. Probably 90% of the chopping. She's in the chopper most of the time. I'm either driving truck or packing or fixing trucks that are broke down on the way. Um, we work pretty well together, you know. Uh, she has to run equipment, which she doesn't always like to do, but I've got to help her sort cows, and I'm not always a big fan of sorting cows. So uh, that's that's what we do together. Um, we do have quite a bit of equipment, but we there's I have to do a lot of that work and so we have to get it done quick you know um, so that's what I, I gotta have equipment to get it done uh, one of our hobbies is uh, we show horses it started with my grandfather we have a six horse stitch of Percherons uh, we travel to a lot of the state fairs in the country as far west as Iowa um, you know we're headed to Georgia next month it uh, gets us off the farm. Uh, it's very important, I think, as dairy farmer, as, a, as you all know, there, and someone mentioned it earlier in the, pre in the presentations, that it doesn't matter what day of the week, what time of the day it is, there's always something that can be done on a dairy farm. And if we don't leave here, I'd work every day, all day, probably. So getting us, uh, my kids are into the horses and um i grew up doing it and we really enjoy it and we've made a lot of friends doing it and uh so uh we we that's that's another you know, small part of our business is is showing the horses and uh, i guess that's it so like i said we we really appreciate uh being nominated and and then of course being um being chosen um, uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, a, a, there's a lot of other farms that are probably just as just just as qualified as we are I guess we couldn't be more humbled about it um, and um, was my grandfather's farm and my dad's farm and mine and it's the first time this farm has ever won this award and and uh, it really gives me a sense of pride and thank you very much and I appreciate your time. Okay great thanks hussies um, from the New Hampshire border right uh, right on outside of the main border next to Freiburg so uh, very close to the main border 
So now we're going to move down to Rhode Island, and uh, we're going to ask uh, Ken Ayers from the commissioner's office to see if he's got a few comments for us. Yeah, so uh, so good to be with you all, and appreciate uh, all involved with the green pastures to keep this important tradition alive. And I'm happy to be part of presenting the Laprises as the winners of our Green Pastures Award. Uh, I work with the, the parents and the kids a lot. It's, it's neat that all four of their kids uh, remain active in agriculture. That's important, keeping the tradition alive. They're an innovative uh, group putting in a farm stand last year, uh, working on a renewable energy project, which we've helped support and you know, trying to move forward, uh, moving forward in a heavily urbanized state where dairy can be difficult, but they're one of our remaining dairy farms, important part of our industry. And uh, we're so happy that they're, and so uh, here, they're uh, deserving of this award and so happy to help uh, honor them tonight. And uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, pass this on to Julie Broder, who's gonna help introduce the family and talk some more about them. And then we're looking forward to the presentation by Little Prezes. so thank you. Great, thanks, Ken. And uh, now we'll go to Julie Broder, who's gonna introduce the winning family. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Julie Broder, and tonight's my first time presenting this uh, award. I also grew up on a dairy farm, and my uh, my parents are very were very good friends with Cynthia's parents, and they were in each other's weddings. So I've known the family for a long, long time. Um, as the livestock chairman of our local fair, I got to watch the whole Lapree family come through and show all their jerseys, which was a great joy. Maggie was only a little girl when she started, and now look at where she is today. Um, I've also served on the board with Rody Fresh, with the Laprise and the other Rhode Island dairy farmers. And I, last year, attended their opening of their farm stand. And when I drove up and I was like, oh my God, look at all the people on this, both sides of the road. And there was a lot of people there. They were serving all kinds of dairy products, cheese, milk, ice cream, and they were also other agricultural activities with the FFA and everything else going on. And I think they've done very well considering that we have a pandemic going on and uh, they brought all that local um, beef, lamb, um, veal um, to everybody's attention and um, I think that's a great thing. Um, I know what the the Emma comes from, which is all the kids' names. And I know the last year that Maggie was in 4-H, um, she got to have the Supreme Champion jersey of the Big E, which is a great honor as well. So with that all being said, I think the Lapree family is the very um, deserving of this award, and it is my um, um, honor that I get to present this to them. So congratulations, great. Maggie and Cynthia. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, Maggie, do you have a couple of words that you want to say before we show your video that you put together? Um, well, thank you for that, Julie. That was a very nice introduction. And Ken quickly reminded me of a new project that we're working on that I forgot to mention in the video. Um, soon we'll be completely run off of solar panels, so we're putting solar power on the tops of the barns. So just something new that we have going on that I completely forgot to mention in our video. So, okay, great. Well, we'll see if we can get the video loaded up here. In 2008, we started shipping milk to the Agrimark Co-op and became members of the Rhode Island Dairy Cooperative. Not only has the farm grown over the years, but our family has definitely grown. There's now six grandkids and three added in-laws. Both of my parents have full-time jobs off the farm where my mom's a registered nurse at Miriam Hospital and on her days off she can be found she can be found babysitting any of the six grandkids or taking care of the store. My dad has his own trucking company where after morning chores when he mixes the feed and scrapes the barn for me, he's off trucking the rest of the day. My oldest sister Elizabeth has two kids, Henry and Ella, and she's also a full-time nurse at the Miriam Hospital with my mom. You can often find Henry trying to drive any of the equipment on the farm and Ella just sitting there shaking her head at her older brother. My brother Matthew and his wife Tiana recently purchased the farmhouse that we grew up in. 
They're now on the farm, and you can find Lillian and Matthew Jr. running around the farm or going for gator rides whenever possible. While my sister Alex works full time through the week, you can find her here on the weekends, either sitting on the front porch at the store, waiting on customers, or on Sunday nights milking in the parlor with her daughter Reagan and Ruby. Reagan, along with her other cousins, Lillian and Henry, can't wait to start showing cows that next summer. And finally, you can find me, the youngest, Maggie, anywhere on the farm from taking care of the cows to milking to doing the farm store, sitting here on my laptop most of the time doing schoolwork because I'm in my senior year at the Penn State World Campus getting my ag business degree. I'm also the only full-time employee on the farm, but I definitely couldn't do it without the support of my parents. My mom is my right-hand lady in the store, and my dad is always right there to fix anything that I break on the farm. We're currently milking 30 registered cows, primarily Jerseys with a few Holsteins scattered in there, and we milk some ash ears for a friend of ours. We started our farm from the ground up where my dad cleared the land and we have sent built buildings for the calf barn, the milk parlor, heifer barns, and dry cow barns. We sit on 12 acres of land where we utilize as much pasture as we can. Since we only have 12 acres, all of our feed is bought in from local farms. We buy our grain from the Blue Seal Company. We buy in all of our corn and hay locally and we also feed the byproducts of brewers grain from local breweries on october 6 2019 we opened our on-farm store in the store we sell the roti fresh fluid milk products the whole line of cabot cheeses as well as the local meats that we raise here on the farm or that we can buy from other local farms such as the lamb we also sell our eggs and the customer favorite, the Warwick ice cream. We've created relationships with our customers. Throughout the pandemic, we realized the importance of local food sources. Our customers have learned to appreciate more where their food comes from, and we thank them for that. Since we opened the farm stand and we are selling so many other products aside from dairy products, we've become more diverse with the animals that we have on the farm. We have chickens, pigs, we raise all of our bull calves up for veal, and we've started to breed all of our heifers to, to Hereford. With the current state of the dairy industry, we realized that we either had to diversify our farm in order to keep the farm successful. I would like to thank the Rhode Island Green Pastures Committee for choosing us to be this year's Rhode Island Green Pastures Outstanding Dairy Farm of the Year. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming, and uh, everybody have a great weekend, and hopefully we'll all be together in uh, Springfield next year. Thanks.